The following Conscious Consumer Network recording of a live broadcast is available to purchase in high definition at ethymarket.com. Support free and independent media by becoming a CCN pledger. For 10 euros a month, you can have unlimited access to CCN high definition downloads at ethymarket.com. Ethymarket, the ethical marketplace for conscious consumers. This is For the Love of Learning, Voices of the Alternative Education Movement. Be inspired by the voices of visionaries, change makers, and ordinary, extraordinary people who do what they do all for the love of learning. Voices of the Alternative Education Movement. I'm Lainey Liberty, and this is episode number 17. The theme of tonight's episode is exploring alternative education on a global scale. In this episode, we look at alternative education around the world through different cultural, social, and economic lenses. Just what is the best way to reach the common goal, achieving a lifelong love of learning? We ask the question, what is the purpose of education? Does the purpose differ from country to country, dictated by cultural norms or even the social preferences of an entire country? And are there special factors to consider only unique in Latin America or the United States or even Europe? And what if alternative education is not commonly accepted? What possibly could be the reasons? Tonight, we'll ask the question, do we actually need schools to become educated? Finally, we'll look at the creative spirit and the individual responsibility to educate our own. Tonight, we'll be having the honor of exploring these questions with more of an international panel representing Mexico, South America, the United States, the Caribbean, Sweden, and Denmark. Fingers crossed. I'm going to give a brief introduction to each of our panelists, then we'll start the conversation. Although these introductions are brief, we'll have more information about each of our panelists on the show notes page located at ConsciousConsumerNetwork.tv and look for the show notes page for episode number 17. There you will find more extensive information about each of our panelists' backgrounds and links to each of their projects and websites. So let's jump right in. First, let's meet Rebecca. Rebecca is a pedagogical visionary and harsh school critic. She is an author, lecturer, and former language teacher. Born in Sweden, she moved to Mexico in 2003. For over a decade, she's been training teachers and giving workshops for parents, teachers, and psychologists. And in 2009, Rebecca co-founded Papalotes, a small uh, Waldorf initiative in the state of Oaxaca, Mexico. In 2012, she co-founded its sister school in Puerto Escondido on the Pacific Coast. In 2005, or 2015, her book about the exciting journey of starting up alternative schools in one of the poorest states in Mexico will be published in Sweden. The overall question Rebe- Rebecca ac- oh, excuse me, asks herself is, why do we need schools? So, Rebecca, I'm so happy you're here on this 
panel tonight, and indeed, that's one of the questions we'll delve into. So welcome. Thank you so much, Lainey. I'm really excited to be, to be with you tonight. Fantastic. Um, next, let's meet Akila. Akila is an author, educated, digital content writer, and lifestyle coach who writes passionate, passionately about self-expression, womanhood, modern feminism, vocation independence, and the unschooling lifestyle. She is a storyteller who believes in the power of expressed personal narrative and deep self-acceptance as tools for authentic self-expression and community enrichment. Welcome, Akila. We have so much to talk about tonight. I'm really, really happy you're here. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here too. As I read through the show notes, I was like, oh, I have questions too. <laughs> so thank you for the space. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Anna. Anna has not logged in yet, but she's booked to be on this panel and confirmed. And my hopes are that there's internet problems and she'll, she'll be joining us shortly. Um, this is Anna's second time on the show, and she is a teacher and the host of the blog, A Teacher's Journey to Life. Anna has over 15 years experience within the education system, including an undergraduate degree in pedagogy and a degree, a graduate degree in educational sociology. She is a contributor to the working class think tank, the Hamptons Institute, Department of Education, and contributes to an independent online sociological journal. Anna calls herself a guerrilla teacher by day and a social media activist by night. She documents her journey on the popular uh, website, um, A Teacher's Journey to Life, and she also um, often posts on a variety of different social media sites in order to contribute, share to the conversation of transformation through education. So hopefully she'll be with us soon. Anna, welcome. This is our big welcome. Hopefully you'll see this during the uh, recorded version and you'll know that you've been welcome to the show. And finally, I'm going to introduce our last panelist. It's Oshun Lade. Oshun Lade is a healer, a spiritual teacher, and a transformational coach. As a divine catalyst for change, she supports and inspires women who are feeling stuck to, to dissolve their stuff, achieve peace, and experience clarity, joy, and abundance. As a space holder for Earthy Mamas and authentic selves, um, healers, spiritually inclined mompreneurs, she has, she has the unique gift of calling forth their empowered authentic selves to do work, to do the work they came here to do and to experience the joy they came here to live. Oshunabe is active within the American unschooling community, which is where I first met her as she supports families across the States with her projects and her love. Welcome, Oshunlade, and I'm so jazzed you're part of this panel tonight, and I'm promising to try not to slaughter your name as, as we continue this conversation. So welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Now you're doing a great job, a great <laughs> job. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm so excited that we get to do something together again. I just enjoy you so much. Oh, me too. Um, why don't we start off the show with you? If you could, please share with us uh, just a little bit about your background and at what point, what was your point of entry into the alternative education movement? And that'll help us set the stage for this show. Okay, yeah, great. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I am a mama, single mama of three sons and my eldest is 19. I have a 19 year old son, an 11 year old son and a five year old son. And so um, we have a lot of fun. I, I always thought that I would do alternative type 
of learning, if you will, with my children, because I've always kind of been an alternative kind of woman. And so the thing that, that really was interesting was when my oldest was born, um, and I was a single mom, and I thought that I didn't know single mothers homeschool or unschool or anything, you know, except for you just kind of had to do um, what the mainstream did. But I wasn't really that willing to do what the mainstream did. So um, he was about from the age of two to four or five, we did like a, a Montessori type program. And um, I eventually got married. We were moving to New York and I was just absolutely not okay with my quiet, um, really introspective, thoughtful, sensitive child getting lost um, in the school system in New York. I was already getting, becoming, um, <clears throat> I don't know what you would call it, but I wasn't happy. <laughs> Even in a Montessori setting, um, I wasn't happy. Um, just simply wasn't happy. And so um, I started picking up all these books, you know, and, and reading about my options because now I'm married. So that means I can homeschool, right? So, so that, that began our foray. That began like the actual foray into alternative, you know, I guess, again, you guess you could call Montessori alternative, but um, us learning from everyday living, us learning um, as a family, us just living life, us just moving through life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that the other major, a couple of the other major aspects that really informed my desire to move in this way have always been culture um, and spirituality, you know, and just the way that I believe, you know, from a spiritual um, indigenous perspective that, you know, we come here with our own unique purpose. We come here with our own path. We come here with our own gifts. And I really have always wanted to be able to support my children and nurture that, which I don't feel that can happen, you know, in a setting where people um, understandably have to kind of gear themselves up for the masses or crowds or to accomplish um, a more, uh, I don't know, what governmental goals or, or how does that work. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> does that does that answer your question? We've been we've been yeah. uh, homeschooling ever since. <laughs> it does, it does. And and I'm excited because there's so many different perspectives on this panel, from this panel. Yet each person from the bios that I've read, they all have different um, desires to help, to help either others or their children. And it's just really fascinating to me to set the stage to see how everybody entered that point, you know, what their point of entry was into alternative education, whatever the modality may be. And I'm, I'm excited actually um, to get into some of the, the support stuff that you do because I'm sure that that um, uh, transfers into your your idea of what education is as well. So thank you for that beautiful introduction. And um, I'm going to ask the same question to Rebecca. So let's jump on over to Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, could you please share with us what was your point of entry into this crazy alternative education world? Well, I think I would have to blame my mother because <laughs> she decided uh, to put me in a Montessori school, uh, preschool first and then uh, primary. Uh, and when I was, I was happy, I was very, I enjoyed school. Um, but when I had to start uh, junior high, I had to go into the traditional system. Uh, Swedish education has been good uh, and still for me, it was it was a shock, and I was 12 years old when I became this harsh school critic. When I was like, "What is going on? Uh, why does it have to be so boring?" Uh, I remember vividly uh, we were three three students from the same Montessori school entering the same classroom, and we were sitting there basically waiting for two years. The first two years of junior high, 
um, in order to get some new information. And I remember we were in the last grade when finally one of the teachers said something that we hadn't heard before. And I remember so clearly how the three of us looked at each other and we went, oh, finally, finally something new. And, and honestly, from, from that time in my life, I've just really wondered why it has to be so tedious, why we all have to go into the same mold, um, what school is really good for. Is it good for anything really? Or could it be good for something if, uh, if we would visualize school as something completely different, but maybe then we would even have to change the word school because when we think of school, it just brings these images of, of traditional classrooms and, and kids in a row. Um, then I became a teacher in Sweden. I, uh, I studied in uh, the University of Uppsala and uh, um, I got my, my, my bachelor in practical pedagogy and I started working in the, in the, the ordinary school system. Uh, but coming from a com completely different background, of course, I was teaching the way I was taught as a child and I, was, I became a very different teacher. And again, you know, I went in with this energy of, whoa, maybe, maybe we can change things, maybe we can make things better. And I do think that for, um, for my, my, my students, it was good. Uh, that's what they've told me and I've heard comments from them uh, when they're finally, you know, adults and they can, they, they can express what they felt. But I couldn't stand the system. I really couldn't. And I realized that the system wouldn't let itself be changed from within or from the outside. A system seems to me to have its own kind of life and it wants to survive really badly. So I couldn't really do anything but leave. And it was with, uh, with great sadness because I felt that I was letting down, I don't know, not only my students, but the school system in general. Uh, then I moved to Mexico and uh, I had no intention of, of continuing with the school system, but I had to have a job. And so I, I found myself a job at one of the universities in Oaxaca City as a French teacher. And again, I was confronted with, um, with the system and what the system does to, to the students. And when in Sweden I had been, I had been teaching um, young people from the age 11 to 18 uh, at the university here in Mexico, I was teaching uh, people from 15 to 30. And I was stunned because uh, there was no uh, initiative taking. There was no sense of being responsible of their own studies. They were there voluntarily. They were paying uh, for the university to give them French. And still, they were, they, they were not capable of, of taking initiatives. And uh, it, um, it really, really got to me. I was really wondering what was going on. I learned a lot about Mexico and the culture, obviously, going in, going in through, through the system in that way. But it wasn't uh, until I, uh, I got my son in, in 2005 um, that I realized that something needed to be done because I'm in Mexico and I'm not moving back to Europe. Um, and I was standing there with him and he was three months old and I was looking into his dark, dark eyes and I was thinking, uh, what am I doing now? <laughs> what am I going to do with him? Because I'm not ever, ever going to send him to a traditional school uh, in this country. And it's not only obviously Mexico. I mean, I think I would have probably felt the same thing in Sweden. It's just that we have more options. And so out of this, um, out of this feeling of rejection towards the system, um, I started going into like checking out homeschooling and I thought it seemed to be a really good option. But I was questioning my, my abilities as a mother to be able to, um, to deal with him and with me <laughs> being a mother and a teacher at the same time. Also considering the fact that we are living in Mexico and I couldn't really find in the southern parts, it's, we're living in one of the poorest states of Mexico and the education on that was very, very low. And I was always thinking, how could I offer any complimentary stuff? We, we don't have anything else um, to, uh, to offer, really. There are no extra courses. There's nothing that I would consider good enough. So, yes, I'm a very picky lady, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and um, 
out of that, uh, I realized that something had to be done and I didn't want to do it only for my son. I thought that if, if something had to be done, it should, um, it should reach more children, not only my son. And so, yeah, it was a process. It was a process and we're still in that process six years after having opened up the first Papalote school. Papalotes is Mexican Spanish for kites, the ones that you fly with on the beach, <laughs> for instance. Um, and so uh, that's where it started. And it's been a, a six year long journey of uh, just exploring the options and exploring this reality here in Mexico, which is very closed if you are referring yourself to the traditional school system. But thank God. Uh, we also live in a very flexible country and there are possibilities of doing other things, even though it's not precisely legal to homeschool the children because our schools, there are two of them, they are like formally, they would be considered homeschools. It's not legal, but it's not uh, prohibited either. It's not illegal because what the constitution says here in Mexico is that as parents, we are responsible for educating our children, not schooling them. So that is the loophole that we're using. Yeah, you brought up so many topics that I want to delve deeper into during the show. Um, but one of the things that I find really fascinating before before I get into all of those things is, is there are certain legal, um, uh, well, legalities that we have to deal with in different countries. And we did a show in the past about the legality of, of homeschooling and even unschooling throughout Europe. Um, I know my son and I have been in South, South America for six years and we jump through those loopholes because we're, we're on tourist visas for the most part. And so we don't have to abide by that. But we interact with school children and we interact with the communities that we live in in order to really immerse ourselves in the culture, which is part of our education. But knowing that they in South America and Central America don't have an understanding of what the value of homeschooling is. It creates quite a, quite a challenge to not only communicate the mode, the modality in which we're, we're um, performing our education, but the value of it. Is this something that you've noticed in Mexico? Um, absolutely, absolutely. And also speaking, coming from a Swedish perspective, in Sweden, it's illegal to homeschool. You have to send your children to school. And in Sweden, at least the way that I've, that I've heard the conversations go, um, it's like as if homeschooling is something you do when, you're, when you have a religion that is very important to you, when you want to avoid Darwin, basically. Uh, so I think that Speaking as a Swede, I would say that homeschooling is just completely not understandable. Why, why would we homeschool children? And here in Mexico, I think that if you don't go to school, it's because it's because you can't afford it or because, you, you know, your parents don't understand that you will have a miserable future. And so I think that it's and, and most people that I know here that are homeschooling are foreigners. Uh, I've never heard of any Mexican family homeschooling their children. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. That's a great introduction. I actually want to jump on over to Akila now and um, give you the floor and hope that you're comfortable sharing with, with us a little bit about your background and what your point of entry was into the alternative education movement. Sure, definitely. Um, so my... My point of entry <laughs> was interesting. It, um, so we are from Jamaica, my husband and I, and, but I've been living in the U.S. for many, many years, left as a child. I was 10 years old when we left the island, and, um, but I go back often. So I started having children. My daughters are 11 and 9, and um, we were living in Georgia, metro Atlanta, Georgia, suburb of Atlanta, and um, our daughters were in elementary school. And well, the oldest one, Marley, was in elementary school. And when she started, uh, she was disengaged and bored pretty much in kindergarten. She came home the first, like maybe the first two weeks, she cried almost every day saying that they had put her in Sage's class, Sage is her little sister. And she was convinced that she was in 
um, you know, like a, a, a little kid's class and she was a big kid and she didn't understand why they were doing little kid things like the alphabet and things like that. And we had been, you know, just doing things at home the way that we do, just engaging. Um, but she just felt disconnected. And so Marley was really my point of introduction because we, I followed my kid. You know, I just I asked her questions and paid attention and saw how she was feeling. And she was she's very um, outgoing, a social butterfly. But after some time in school, is she came home and it, it was different. Her energy was different. And so um, um, after so we said, OK, well, maybe it's because school is new. And so we just have to figure it out and do things at home. And um, after, I don't know, maybe six or so months, her elementary school teacher, her kindergarten teacher, wonderful woman said, um, she said she thought Marley was gifted and wanted to do some testing with her. And long story short, she went through all the tests and got all the labels and um, they wanted to put her in the fourth grade which was our first like big red flag because we saw that they weren't focused on the whole child. You know, they were just looking at one aspect or oh, academically she can handle this. So then let's put her there. And this is new for my husband's name is Chris for Chris and me. This was totally new, our first child. Um, so we, we kind of followed it along for a little bit and, and we said, well, no, she can't go to the fourth grade cause she's six. That's crazy. So they put her in the second grade and then had some supplemental stuff. So she was going to like gifted math with a different two. So she was just like all over the place. And so she was missing recess because gifted math happened at the time that recess was happening with her kindergarten class. So it, it, just, it just wasn't okay for her. She was all over the place and she didn't feel like she was herself, you know? And she, was, she would say things like, there's so many things that I need to say, but I don't know who to say them to because I'm everywhere all the time. Like, these are the things she would say. So, um, and so we started looking into homeschooling. But for me, that felt like it wasn't an option because I, I didn't want to do it. That's my main reason. I definitely did not want to come up with that. I didn't, school was something I did because I needed to do it, not because I wanted to. So I wasn't going to grow up and then make myself do more school, you know? <laughs> so um, that wasn't an option, mother or not. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I just kind of admired all of my friends who did it and said, you know, well, how can I cheat off your paper? Like, what do I do here with my kid? And then um, I came across Stop Stealing Dreams, which is this manifesto that Seth Godin put out, and I don't know whether, yeah, and I was like, ah, oh, all kind of shoulder shimmy, and like, that was just like, I needed to hear that, you know, so then followed down that path and found out about like John Holt and unschooling and that whole world, and it just, it was the right thing. It was just the right thing for us, this idea that we would continue what we were already doing, which was following our daughter and then our bo both daughters lead as to what, what they wanted to do and how they experienced themselves and the world through their own lens. And so we, um, we said, um, we started, we, we said, okay, well, we're going to pull her out of school for a little bit. And then we said, oh, well, we should go to Jamaica, you know, because we, you know, wanted to make sure that that's where we're from. And culturally, that's really important to us as well. And that was the other thing with school, like culturally, there was no raising. So we were in Georgia, which is the South in the U.S. And raising a black child in the South um, is like raising them with their eyes covered and their ears covered. And this idea that in order for them to be OK, that they need to be as close as possible to someone else, most likely their teacher, who was usually a white woman. No problem with who she is, but definitely a problem with needing to, to associate um, value and intelligence and information, just something as basic as information, with someone outside of yourself and, and someone that you would never be. So we started noticing those things as, a, you know, through her matriculation and then realized that we had to do something different. And so we started to travel a little bit more. So instead of going to Jamaica for two weeks, you know, we would try to go during a longer stint like the summer. Um, and then just got, I got more comfortable with it. And so we then just detached. We realized that we were um, connected or tethered in a sense to this whole life 
of living in a really nice house in a really nice neighborhood and having cars and it, we just it just wasn't us and so we let our house go sold one car gave the other one to a family member moved to Jamaica stayed with some family members until we could figure out how to live somewhere <laughs> and we're in our fourth year of location independent living and unschooling is one of the factors but we really so our daughters were really our point of entry into this world of um just living and understanding that learning is a very organic thing you don't have to stage a learning experience you don't have to make sure that your child is learning you just you have to facilitate and listen and look and that's that's kind of how it happened for us <laughs> amazing this is what a great introduction and so far every introduction has just set perfectly set the stage for the topics here i mean i really want to dive into a lot of the things that you've talked about and it is indeed so incredibly inspirational we're happy to report that Anna is here, <laughs> and um, Anna, I do want to jump over to you and give you the opportunity to give us an introduction. Um, the panel is, it's such a unique group of women on this panel, and I'm so looking forward to hearing all the different perspectives, and I think this is, this is I'm, I'm just so, so anxious to get into the meat of all this. So the introductions have inspired me dearly. And Anna, the floor is yours. If you could share with us a little bit of your background and let us know your point of entry into the alternative education movement. Sure. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Anna. Um, can you hear me? Great. Well, so my introduction into the alternative education community started when I was born, um, you could say, which is interesting because it's something that I haven't really considered until now as an adult working in the education system, actually seeing that there was a lot of the indoctrination and things that I think people tend to take for granted about the education system, or shall I say the schooling system, um, that was not part of my education as a child. And, you know, when I kind of rewind everything and I look back, I can see that that is partly some, one of the reasons why I eventually became the way that I became, which is to now work as a, I call myself kind of a guerrilla teacher because I, I basically work with unschooling in the school system. Um, so how I came to do that, I'll share a little bit about that. So I grew up with parents that were very progressive and kind of radical and they, from day one, they knew that they, they didn't want to, to place me in the normal public school system. So um, for my entire primary education, I went to a free school based on, there's a French edu educator called Celestin Frenet, who has a, some specific principles that, that he believed in. One of them being to respect a child's creativity and the child's or the human being's creativity and desire to work and to create meaningful products or a meaningful life for themselves that that was like the core of this education so this is something that i grew up with i grew up learning to trust my own creativity and that there were adults that respected that um so it became a natural part of my being and seeing that the school system does not offer that um you know, now I'm talking about primarily the public school education system, but as well as the private education system, it does not offer that, not even by a long shot. And so I grew up and I decided to to start working in education and I became very disillusioned. Um, first, I became a preschool teacher and I might like my, I had this very noble goal of saving the children and making a difference. And I came into, by the way, I'm, I'm from Denmark originally, and I'm living in Sweden now. But I came into this, this preschool world, and I was horrified. Um, not by the children, but by the rigidity, and the, it was so boring. It was such a boring life, such a boring working life. And it was such a contradiction to what children are to me, which is full of life and full of creativity and full of exploration. And then you have these rigid, dare I say, prison-like days where everything is placed into these systems um, that, you know, it's done 
supposedly with a with a well-meaning intention of you know children need structure and they need rules and orders and and so that's the idea and i just felt that a lot of these people primarily i worked with women they were so frustrated and so exhausted and all of that would of course transfer to the children in one way or another so i became very disillusioned and and very frustrated with that and I, I just decided that I couldn't do it and that I had to get in on a different level of the education system um, because I started seeing that it was the system in itself that was flawed. Like I wanted to go in and say, you have this space, you have these children, you have these resourceful adults, but the system that they're working in is flawed. So I decided to, to take a master in educational sociology and get in on a more, you could say, academic or systemic level, you know, maybe eventually go into politics. Um, but of course, even there, I was disillusioned as well, um, because the academic world is very far removed from reality. It's very abstract, it's very theoretical, it's very, you know, you sit on, almost like on a pedestal looking down on reality. So when I was done with that, I decided to get back into the, to the grid, um, and I went back into the school system, but this time I had this arsenal of theory, of sociological theory and pedagogical theory, um, and I had all this experience. So I started experimenting with seeing, basic, my, my goal was basically how can I be the best possible teacher I can be based on everything that I've learned throughout my life. And slowly but surely that, in, um, evolved into unschooling and looking back at everything now I realized that I've been supporting unschooling my entire life I've been doing unschooling my entire life the principles like you were saying Akila with following the child like it's natural it's common sense I just didn't know what it was called I didn't have a name for it and so when I discovered for example John Holt and these theories um, it was just, the, you know, this world of new vocabulary that opened up, that there are names for it. Um, and, and when there are names for it, when you can call things, things something, when you can define it, you know, it becomes much more grounded in a way, rather than being instinctual, because I was also quite concerned, you know, I'm doing this, I'm experimenting um, like Rebecca was talking about the Swedish school system and the Swedish system is like, it really believes in its school system. And uh, there are not a lot of uh, room for stepping outside the, the boundaries. So I was scared initially and I realized that I had to trust my gut and I had to go with my integrity, which was to let go of control. And the more I let go of control, the more education emerged. The more I let go of my ideas of learning, despite even coming from an alternative schooling myself, I had all these traditional ideas about what learning is supposed to be. And when I let go of that, real education started emerging and the kids, all resistance, all refusal, um, all of that went out the door and their creativity emerged. And not only that, because I mean, that part in itself was amazing, but also an authenticity and a vulnerability within them and between them and myself started opening up because I could be more myself. I didn't have to play a role of being a teacher. And I've noticed how this is, and this is what I basically saw back then in, in kindergarten that is so tragic is that we as adults take on these roles as being strict and disciplinary. And, and it's just not even, you know, it's not even who we are and it's a miserable life. And imagine you, you know, being like that as a parent, but imagine being like that as a teacher and you don't have any other guidelines because that's what you've seen other adults do. You don't know that it can be any different. It feels kind of like, it's, I really resonate with what Rebecca was saying because it feels kind of like stepping out of a religious doctrine to step out of that system. Like it's forbidden somehow to see children as equals, to see them as real human beings that has real values of their own. So that is what I've been working with uh, the past few years. And at the moment, um, 
I'm writing a book on all of this uh, because I've been writing a blog called The Teacher's Journey to Life. When I started, the first day I started teaching here in Sweden. So I've been, been writing my progress and my reflections all throughout these past four years. Um, and so, so my goal is ultimately, I would really like to work with other teachers. And of course, as Rebecca said, homeschooling and unschooling is of course illegal in Sweden. So we don't have that option. So I have to find other ways um, to share these principles and to also share them with people in a country where there is like a very big trust in the education system. So that's a little bit uh, about my story. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. Amazing. And again, everybody has perfectly set the stage for what's going to unfold next. What I'd really like to talk about is uh, really derived from, from Anna's introduction and from everybody's introduction, I really want to talk about the systems, the systems of belief, the systems of belief about education, and the cultural and multicultural um, lenses that we see them through. And some of them are given to us. Some of them are perhaps, you know, um, individually thought of. But I think for the most part, it's a societal belief that those of us that are really um, passionate about alternative education have to go against the grain. And so I'd like to, I'd like, I'm going to take this question to the panel. Panel, who would, any, anybody, um, any of you would like to speak about um, the belief systems that you've had to overcome either from the um, systematic perspective, the educational system perspective, or from a cultural, uh, societal perspective. Yeah, uh, I definitely want to address that because I, I feel this is our fourth year as unschoolers, and we are still very much de-schooling. You know, like this, this there, there were so many things that I didn't know that I didn't understand, if that makes sense. Because as, as much as um, I've always been in deep connection with my intuition and, and, I, and I trust it implicitly. So that's kind of what led me. And then all the intellectual stuff kind of comes after that. You know, once I realize that I need to be going in a direction, then I shore up my decision with data, right? And so for me, unlearning a lot of these these ideas coming from you know jamaica is very much a traditional christian based country and i love my foundation i still feel very much connected that's why i come back home all the time but i don't what i'm not connected to are the the systems so religion i have none structure in those places i have none and so i i realized from unschooling how much of that was still a part of my decision-making process, even though I consider myself someone outside of those systems. So for example, when we started unschooling, one of the first things that I wanted to do was set up like power hours where they could work on these things and tell me what they learned here. Like we were constantly asking, so what'd you learn today? You know, and things like that. And, and it seems normal, it seems maybe even healthy, but what I learned over time is that it was really those things, those sort of questions are like remnants of the schooling space where you're asking someone to prove something because you're not sure whether it's happening or not. So just those little sort of things that I, I recognize and, and, um, and also understanding the, the, the idea that children, you know, as you said, I so love that you said that, Anna, that they're their own people and that you can respect them as people and not as um, lesser beings in some way. Like our decision-making processes changed when we started unschooling because we factored in their decisions, not just in things like, well, where do you want to go today? But in like the neighborhoods that we were going to live in and just understanding that um, you create community by mutual respect and when you do that, like as an adult, there's so much that you learn and there's so much that you free yourself from as well. As you said also, Anna, like this, you, you're, you don't have to be this version of yourself. You know, when I think about the perfect mom, that used to be for me like the clear Huxtable, you know, sort of thing where 
it seemed like if she cursed, like the whole world would implode. You know, she said a curse word or, you know, she wasn't dressed a certain way. And I love that I get to be myself with my daughters. Like they know Akila in real life, like the same Akila that Lainey would know or Becca would know or Ocean Lottie. Like they're not knowing this version of me that's like, well, girls, today at dinner, you will use, your, you know, like just, I just realized how much, how much of myself I wasn't anymore, how much I'd become who I needed to be and separated from who I just organically am. And so those systems, they do such a great job of preparing us for the traditional route of working a great job because I was getting ready to go to law school when I became pregnant with Marley, working at a great law firm in Atlanta, had gotten my college degree, checklist, 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 you know, all of those things. But then coming to realize that none of those things are, are who I actually am. Those are just the things I need to do. So breaking away from the system through unschooling, really, really, it started out about a focus on my daughter's but it really just became the whole world. It opened up the whole world quite literally from that space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can I add something to this as well? What I see is, is really the big challenge is that, you know, we have all been through the same indoctrination process that we're now in some way or another, that we're now seeing that we have to basically stop in its tracks, right? So that's like the big challenge and, and that is what's so interesting but also so powerful about schooling and education is that there's not a single person in this world that hasn't been through it in one way or another. So I think that that's one of the most important things to not disregard that fact that I do come with a lot of baggage and just because I see, you know, it would be better to do it in a different way or it would be best to do it in this way, um, that we have a lot of behavioral patterns, like you were saying, Akila, that that we that we have to de-school our, ourselves from, and I think that that's that recognition of that is very important to not just assume that just because you see what is best means that you'll automatically be able to do it as well, right? So it it takes a lot of practice and and being able to honestly also observe yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you're saying, both of you, because, because I, I think that when I left Sweden, I basically left the system behind. Uh, and it was a huge feeling of freedom for me to be able to just step out of it and come to a country where there are systems. But since I'm a foreigner, even though I have my Mexican passport nowadays, uh, I'm still not in the system. And uh, the freedom that I have standing outside of the system in general uh, is a freedom that I see that Mexicans in general, they don't have. So it is really so much more complicated for, for families here to, to dare the jump, to, to dare um, challenge um, their beliefs because they, they really do believe that what they lived, even though they know it wasn't good, they all say, but I survived. And I'm always thinking, yes, you've survived, but who would you have been if you wouldn't have been through that system? Who would you have been today? Would you have worked with something different? Would you have been more creative? Would you have developed other passions? Who would you have been today? And, and they all say that thing, I survived it, my children will survive it too. And of course, we do survive, but I do think that we really clip their wings. And I think that we've all been wing clipped. And I think it's just a profoundly sad fact. And what I realize here in Mexico is that um, people really do believe that, that the school is necessary, the uniforms are necessary. It's so hard for them to even visualize it to be different. Uh, I remember very clearly in the beginning, like when, when Papa Lotus didn't exist and I was just this desperate mom looking for other mothers uh, interested in educating their children in a different way. I remember clearly uh, a woman from Britain and she said, I know I'd like something different, but I was brought up in the compulsory system and I really can't even visualize what it could look like. And um, I think that is like one of the biggest challenges uh, that and, and the fact that the parents that we do have at these two schools, 
the families that we do have, they they need exactly as I need to to like de-educate ourselves in order to be able to re-educate ourselves. And that is another resistance that I meet every day. It's like, oh, it's fine. I'm sending my kids to this very different school that doesn't look like a school and where the kids, they don't say that they go to school. They say they go to Papa Lopez. <laughs> and so they're happy. And the parents, they think that it's fine with that. And I don't think it's fine with that because it's about changing mental paradigms. And if we want to change these paradigms in our children, we need to be coherent as parents and we need to challenge these belief systems too. And I can see like just one theme that pops up all the time is discipline. And you talked a little bit about it, Anna, uh, like this turning into someone, you know, and you said it too, Akila, you turn into someone that you don't even want to be. And it's because they can't visualize uh, discipline as something as in like something like an inner quality. I have my self-discipline to sit down and work with my knitting because, because I want to, because I want to be able to, to learn something new because I want to master it because the feeling when I've finished whatever it is I'm knitting on is incredible, you know, and that kind of inner discipline or the fact that, you know, we don't need to tell the children what to do or what to how to you like you know lower the voices because the other children will tell them if you if you yell like that i can't work um we don't need to tell them because it can be born from the inside and i think that just a little thing like discipline is something that basically all of us misunderstand and we all think that it's something that needs to come from out from the outside something that needs to be imposed on the children so i really think we do need to confront ourselves with our beliefs. Uh, and I think most of us are not even conscious of the fact that we do have these beliefs and that these beliefs are truths. They're like carved in stone until someone comes and shake them up. Uh, but it's not that easy. This, this to me is like one of my biggest goals in my personal life, not only through these schools, but see what can I, what could I rock like on a, on, a, on, a, on a national level, or for instance, what could I contribute uh, with in Sweden, uh, just like to rock the system a little bit and see if we could maybe provoke it or provoke people on the outside and, and contribute to a change. Yeah, um, I just wanted to hop in. Um, everything everyone's saying is just so powerful. I just, I wanna say, yeah, 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 everything everyone's saying. Um, Anna, that was so powerful what you mentioned um, about us all being influenced, us all kind of being indoctrinated, if you will, by the collective consciousness. And like, even with your background, when you did your, uh, your first thing that you said during your introduction, it was just like really uh, a powerful reminder that, you know, we all have our work to do, you know, and no matter how we were raised or how we're raising our children that we're always constantly, you know, um, moving and growing and expanding, hopefully, um, and doing those things. And Becca, I, um, what really made me want to just hop in too was when you were talking about the discipline thing. And um, I agree. I agree that a lot of times people, um, their definition of discipline seems to be, you know, a bit different from what I think it is, which tends to be that thing that you do when you really want something, <laughs> that thing that you do, you know, because something is really important. And it made me think about um, my oldest son uh, has chosen to go to college. He's been in college for a little while now. And um, another uh, friend of mine who has some younger children were, were just really like quizzing me about, you know, you know how's he doing? And, you know, is he studying? And, you know, and people are amazed, you know, that someone who didn't go to a mainstream school, um, that he's doing what he's doing, which is interesting because those of us who went to regular school, if you will, know that school did not teach us discipline, whatever that's supposed to mean. You know, I mean, that's so funny to me. You know, I mean, just think back to when you were in school. Like, seriously. But so, you know, and so it's like he's doing what he's doing because he chose to do that. He wants to do that. There is an end result or just maybe not even an end result, just 
he's somewhere that he wants to be at this time, learning what he wants to learn, choosing to, you know, step into whatever it is that he's stepping into. And, um, and it's all good. And, um, Akila, I love what you were saying about uh, Claire Huxtable and all that stuff, because that was kind of like a big hurdle for me. Like, oh, my God, these people see me all the time. I cannot hide. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot hide, you know, and, and, you know, be all perfect when they come home or whatever. Not that I was going to make that work. But, uh, yeah. And so um, and then, Lainey, you were asking kind of culturally what some of the barriers or some of the challenges have been. I think one of the biggest for me has been that culturally, like what we do kind of doesn't really exist culturally. I mean, we're doing it, you know what I mean? But, you know, you're over here and you're over there and you're over there. And so for me, as someone who really uh, desires community, that has been kind of a challenge. And then, um, Speaking of the word discipline, like even how other people discipline their children, you know, it's, it's been a challenge for who do I, you know, trust my children with or who do I, you know, be around or who do I connect with because, you know, we're all in different places as it relates to um, um, how we show up. And then um, Akila was talking about the South and, you know, I am definitely in the Bible Belt. And um, yeah, so it all informs a lot of things. So I think uh, that whole thing of wanting to see your reflection and, and, and that, that, that healthy thing of being uh, mirrored, you know, not like you have to, you know, do what other people are doing, but just that, that connection with people um, who are doing what we're doing. Sometimes that feels um, a little disconcerting. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. This conversation is absolutely inspirational. Um, I wanted to share with this group one of the things that really struck me and became a, a, a big teacher. And like many on this panel, my goal too is to really help um, spread the word that alternative education is a movement. It is a movement. It's in a movement of thought at this point. And we are together as a group, as a panel, as, as a movement challenging these systems. But what I wanted to share was having the gift of being able to travel through um, developing nations for the last six years with my son. As an outsider, we've been able to observe how people in our host countries observe education and so the belief that education is the only way out of poverty this is a story that's been told to those in the developing nations and as i reflect back to my time in a first world nation the united states where i'm from i could see how i never questioned that it just became part of the truth that rebecca was talking about earlier so there are these systems of truth that are like I said, either given to us or we agree to or we do not challenge. And, and the de-schooling process then becomes, as um, Akila was talking about, you know, such an important part of our, our own personal growth as we move through, um, you know, be stronger in our stance with alternative education. I, based on that, I want to ask a question to this panel. What gives you the strength to go against the grain or the systems that are in place to step outside of it and move into what you know is your own truth? So I'll just put that to the panel. Yeah, I'd like to jump in there. Um, well, my perspective is that I don't have a choice. It's not a choice. It's a responsibility. Um, when I see little children coming into the school system, and this is in a quote unquote perfect industrial system, meaning they're not exposed to physical abuse, they're not exposed to child labor. This, here we're talking about a healthy, perfect human child that comes into the school system and is broken down. They come in with light in their eyes, they want to learn. And you know what? If you talk to 
any little child. They love animals. They love the earth. They don't understand wars. They are, you know, the perfect potential to become a peaceful, harmonious adult. And we take that, and this is in the most intelligent and advanced education system systems in the world, and we break it down. And 20 years later, this adult comes out that is broken and that has no self-esteem and that is, you know, full of contradictions and addictions and inner conflicts. And I mean, you know, if we take it to a very like existential or an absolute level, this is why the world looks the way that it does, because we keep perpetuating the same. Like, I mean, this, as you can tell, this really gets me fired up. So I don't see like the fact that I can see that um, is not like something that I see. It doesn't make me special. It doesn't. It it is a responsibility. The fact that I can see that and my neighbor can't is simply because of a difference in our education. You know, maybe he like you were saying, Becca. You have to be exposed to people that share that with you. Be exposed to other cultures. I was lucky enough to be that. Maybe he weren't. So I have a responsibility for our children and if you want to really take it to an absolute level essentially for the future of this planet because right now we're, we're destroying everything um so i have that i mean i see it as a responsibility and and that is what keeps me going um that is what makes me go up here at 2 a.m in the morning and talk to you guys because it's so important to me than than more than anything else in the world yeah, can I hop in? I mean, honestly, I get so excited when I hear you say these things, Anna, because that is exactly where I'm coming from. Uh, I don't have a choice. Uh, I see it as a responsibility. It's something that I can give from myself, this different perspective. Uh, and I think that both of us were lucky enough in our first world countries, Scandinavia, to be exposed to a different kind of education as children. And then that just made us, I think, click. It, it something clicked when we were exposed to the tra traditional system and honestly you know i this is the biggest theme in my life i i can't stop thinking about it and i'm just like pulling in new people uh, with whom i can have these conversations because i do believe with all my with all my core being that if we want to uh, transform the planet and change society and turn it turn this planet into a peaceful and loving place we have to start with education. There is no other way around it. Uh, we have to start with the children when they're small. I mean, basically, we're all fucked up, you know, as adults. There's nothing to do. We were broken as children. Uh, and even though I was lucky enough to have a different education, I still had to deal with the traditional system for six years and another six years of university. And it's not something that builds self-esteem. It's not something where you learn how to uh, be compassionate and empathetic and loving and caring and sharing. Nothing of which I believe would, would com contribute to a different kind of world. And so to me, it was really easy to get clear on this, this issue uh, here in Mexico, because as well, you know, uh, the news that are coming from Mexico to the rest of the world aren't very happy news. It's pure violence, corruption. It's bad. Uh, and it's really sad because it's such a beautiful country and it's so full of loving and caring people. And when I was working at the university as this French teacher that I used to be, <laughs> um, I could so clearly see the correlation between how these these students of mine had been growing up in a system that just made them incapable of of being themselves incapable of of making choices built upon what they really wanted and it scared me it really scared me and then i i saw the country and of course i'm not here as a conqueror um and sometimes it, it makes me worried, you know, that I'm coming here as this white woman, even though I'm the dark woman in, in, in Sweden. Um, I'm here as this white woman and, and trying to, to change things. Um, 
but it's it's not as an imposition. It's really because I do believe that if Mexico is to change, we need to start from another perspective, and that is the children and giving them something that will build them up as beings on on a really like on a soul level. And uh, yeah, and then suddenly, you know, of course, I'm always having this this eye on on Sweden and seeing what's going on there, and I don't see. I don't see a difference because what I'm seeing in Sweden right now is a suppressed people too. They have been suppressed and it's like they have never learned how to deal with their darkness because we're always so nice and so cute and so friendly. And <laughs> then suddenly things are happening and there is racism and there is viciousness and people are violent because they always have to be so nice all the time. And I'm just thinking something has gone totally out of control. People have not uh, had the chance and the possibility of really uh, being themselves. They've had to suppress their darkness. And how can they be, how can they be like full and, and complete beings if they can't like take their, their both dual sides into one whole? Uh, and I see that in Sweden all the time and I'm just, I'm just sad, but I'm I'm hoping now that I am getting to know Anna, maybe you know <laughs> things, things are moving. It's 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 bringing hope into me, absolutely. Oh man, this I had to unmute and just like dive in here. This is so so very nourishing. It, there's this this idea of the whole self, the whole child, the whole person, is what's that's my answer. You know, when you ask that question, Lainey, about what what keeps you going in that space. It's that, that well, I call my work radical self-expression. It's a term that I thought I made up until I heard about Burning Man and all that they do. It's this big festival in Nevada and they do um, radical self-expression, even though they don't have like an actual definition for it. Um, but for me, it's that, this idea that each of us absolutely need radical self-expression. We need to understand the multifaceted nature of ourselves of being and then also as the adults we have that responsibility as you said anna to open that door and and facilitate that space for children not just our children but children because these little compartments they worked when you lived in your hometown and you only dealt with the people in your hometown that were brought up with the same ideas that you had and you hid things the same way and your parents weren't open and their parents aren't open either you know you learn the same set of rules but now, thankfully, it's such, it's a wide open world. You know, our, my, my daughters, their friends are in Sweden and um, Amsterdam and, you know, like they, all different parts of the world and different parts of um, different continents, they're everywhere. So it's this flattened world space. And so now you are forced and I think um, it's about time to deal with the whole self. You have to understand, why am I frustrated if I didn't understand what she said? Oh, because I grew up in a space where everybody sounded just like me, and now I need to open up and understand what that means to listen and to look at body language and to understand myself and my own quirks. So this, the whole person is the big driver for me because I want my daughters to be confident people. I, I have no... Um, concerns about whether they'll be educated because learning happens organically. Uh, what I, because I, and also because I know a lot of people who have all the letters behind their names, advanced degrees, I was almost one of them. Thank you that I missed that. <laughs> but um, I know so many educated fools, you know, so many people who have all the learning, all the book stuff, but to sit and have a heart to heart with them. Or as you said, Anna, this idea of being up on this pedestal because you are so educated, but it's theoretical. It's theoretical. When it comes to dealing with an actual person, you don't have any idea what that means, including and especially the person in the mirror. You know, you, there are all of these hangups and then you're unhappy with yourself. And I, I, I don't remember if it was Becca or Anna who talked about naming. You know, the power of being able to name an emotion, to name a feeling, to know what you are, what, what you are needing in a moment. School, by necessity, by the design of the system, shuts that out because everyone needs to get up at the end of this hour, fingers on your lips, single file line, and go on to the next place. And, and I'm not, I actually am not a, a school basher. I, I prefer to focus on um, like even the term unschooling, I would much rather it be something else because I think things are better defined by what they are 
you know, as opposed to what they're not. But I understand that, you know, language wise, you kind of have to start where people are. But but for me, just this idea that you get to open it up and that my girls can work on like my youngest is infatuated with drawing eyes. You know, so she has um, sketchbook, the program, and then she goes, they love anime and manga. So they're looking at the eyes of the different and they will spend, especially Sage, like four hours working on an eye. That makes me feel good. That makes me feel accomplished as her mama to be able to give her the space to work on that eye. Because right now that's where she is. And you better believe that that eye Drawing that eye is not just about drawing that eye. That's also about, as you said, discipline. You know, as Becca said, with, you know, learning to, to knit and the, the feeling of that. Everything, we have a saying here, everything is everything. And it's true. There's this interconnectivity, but we've been taught in these one-hour segments. And so for me, doing this this way, why I have to do it, why I have no choice, is so that you can understand yourself from a full whole person perspective, because that's where you get to, to be you and to not be so judgmental of the rest of the world, you know? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I just wanted to hop in real quick to give my input about the question about why, you know, why we do what we do or how do we find the strength to do what we do. And a lot of things just really came up uh, for me. Um, uh, Akila, you mentioned before about moving on intuition. And so I would have to say that's a really powerful thing. I would also have to agree. It's like, I really have no choice. And so a lot of times, I mean, there have been times, I mean, I remember when we started this lifestyle, probably every year I would just kind of go inside and be like, am I doing the right thing? Is this, you know, is this what I'm supposed to do? You know, again, when you feel like a trailblazer sometimes, which is kind of like, wow, you know, constantly checking in, constantly checking in. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I remember those days of, of making sure this is what I'm doing. And then again, not really having an option, you know, just knowing. I just, I, I was not willing to turn over my three African descendant, black male sons <laughs> to, to this this system, you know, so that's that's another aspect of it. And I think uh, Becca was saying the thing about uh, building up souls, I think you said. And so, you know, that was my thing. I'm like, I, I want to support in building up their soul. I don't want to participate in someone tearing them down and me trying to like build them back up on, you know, on the, on the, in the sidelines, you know, whatever, whatever that would look like. But, you know, more and more and more, I am absolutely not okay with turning them over um, to um, a system that you know does not have their best interests at mind at in heart at heart at all. So that's my my input around that. Uh, how do you keep doing what you're doing? <laughs> and that takes some strength to go there. So this panel is filled with strong, passionate women, and I am so blessed to be here with you all tonight. So I have another question for you all, and I'll take this to the panel and jump in. If we're to create a new system, a new system, which which we're all envisioning and all acting and all, all supporting and facilitating in our own ways, how do we facilitate the love of learning in those around us? So I'd like to take that to the panel. Uh, okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I don't think we need to really facilitate the love of learning. Uh, on the contrary, we have to prevent that which is not allowing it to flow. <laughs> so that's actually a quite simple answer because every child, every person, not even just children, but everyone, like you were talking about knitting, Becca, for example, everyone loves to learn. But the thing is, the, the thing is, is that most of us as adults, as adults, we are caught in a web of survival and doing things that we don't do because we want to do them, but because we have to survive or because we have to keep up appearances. So that's why we, we seldom see it come through in adults. Um, but with children, you know, it's just like, it's just a fountain of loving to learn. So as an adult, you know, your job becomes a lot easier because then all you have to do really is to facilitate that. 
So that would be my perspective. Yes, yes. I love that, Anna. I'm just like typing, yes, yes, to everything you're saying here, because that's exactly what I think it is too. For me, um, th- even even with my daughters, like them, they kind of like go into the circles of the schooled ones and, <laughs> and like, and and really just incite that sort of thing in other children. So you have the people in our community who are, um, our children are interacting with theirs, especially when we go to new cities like you, Lainey, and, and just, you know, kind of immerse ourselves in the space where they're going home and saying to their parents, um, Marley and Sage didn't go to school, but they still know these things. You know, just just leaving it in a sense to to them because they do that. And also context. Like I think that what's important about what we're doing, like Lainey, thank you so much. I'm gonna probably say it 50 times for creating this space because it's so important. Yeah, it's so important that we just have this dialogue out loud. That that is one way that we facilitate, if you will this thing, to have these conversations out loud, to invite other people into this space, not from a space of you're doing something wrong, but here, here is another thing that you may not have considered, or here's something to add to the arsenal. I always um, say that to people that there, there are ways, I have a, a course up, <laughs> funny enough, an unschooling course, unschooling on course, um, that, and, I, and I go into unschooling from the aspect of entrepreneurship because they're very connected. Again, everything is everything, everything is connected, truly. And for me, unschooling helped me so much as a business owner because I realized how much of a, a box and how un out I had become. And so I had to reclaim my meanness. And in reclaiming my, my daughters, you know, giving them space to reclaim what they considered learning, I also reclaimed my meanness. And the same thing with my husband. We're both uh, digital nomads. We're full-time entrepreneurs. Most of our work is online. But we had taken a lot of the formal education because we were both corporate employees for some time. But we had taken a lot of that formality um, and brought it into entrepreneurship. So even though we were free, quote unquote, you know, from from the job, we we still were operating in that structure. And so observing our children and understanding more about um, how learning happened and how structure takes form. You don't plan and then insert yourself into the plan. You observe, right? And you feel and you go through that path and then you create the plan. It, you know, so there's like this ecology that happens between you and the idea that comes up and you, and like any other relationship, they, both parts matter. And so, and, and so when you go into that whole selfness, that mode, that's where that shows up and that's how come you don't have to facilitate a thing you create structure as it unfolds so that's how other people are going to come into alternative education because they're going to see what's not happening with their children they're going to see um you know how their children start to flourish when they're in spaces with other children who know who they are and who are comfortable making mistakes, that, that simple thing. School, school you know, um, stops you from wanting to make a mistake because it affects your grade and then it affects how your parents deal with you and how your teacher looks at, you know, that's, that's just one small thing. So you, 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 you facilitate, in a sense, the, the spread of the alternative education option by living it out loud, truly. Absolutely beautiful and so passionate and so well spoken. Um, I really appreciate everybody's candor about you know how do you facilitate for the love of learning, and I think it really is a matter of just stepping out of the way and allowing it to unfold. And you you tap both of you tapped on that so clearly. Um, I do want to ask another question to this panel, and I think it's an important question. Um, do we need schools? <laughs> that is such a good question. I don't know if we need schools. What I do know is that one system is not fitting everyone. That I do know. And what I feel is that if we could step out of the idea of what a school is and just imagine a completely different space where people could uh, grow and learn in any kind of direction that they want to, 
I think that schools could be an incredibly powerful tool to create a new society. And uh, I've been thinking so much about these things these last years, obviously. Uh, I don't know what it would look like. I'm just trying to imagine. Now, when you were speaking, Akila, and I was thinking of, of like, you take all these children and I look at the adults and it's just such a, it's such a gap, you know, between this, these free spirited, you said it too, Wana, these free spirited children that they, they can do anything. They have this interest and this curiosity. And then I look around myself and I look at the adults and I go, what happened? <laughs> Oh, school happened, the system happened. And it makes me really sad because at the same time, I'm thinking there should be a huge potential for, for school as a forum, but a completely different one. That is why I'm not sure it can even be called schools because, because it, the word doesn't challenge our ideas and our belief systems enough. But if we imagine like a learning space, um, I think that it could really be a fabulous tool for for changing society because I really see that that schools are preparing the the young generations for the same kind of mold that we're all rejecting that we don't like and so why do we have to repeat this all the time it's ridiculous and what if what if this learning space could promote healthy persons, complete persons, whole persons that know who they are, that know their passions, that know their talents, that can actually all contribute with what they come with, with all their essence, contribute to this world instead of just feeling like a fail failure and they do what they have to do because that's what we were brought up to believe. And in that sense, I don't know. I really want to think that the possibility of, of, of whatever this thing is, if we don't call it a school, could, could bring on world peace. I mean, it sounds so vague and flaky maybe, but I, I honestly believe so. And that's why I think that it would be so interesting. And that's why uh, I am part of, of these two schools, uh, because they're different, because they're not traditional schools and because there's so much potential in them. And because I think it's an inter interesting experiment to see how we can do this um, uh, and still keeping a structure. Because uh, I'm thinking like me as, as a person and as a mother, as I said, I'm, I'm not ready to take on that role. I'm completely ready to let my son live something totally different. But I, I wouldn't know how to do it. And, and in that sense, to me, it's nice. I'm still in, enough in that system where I'm, I'm thinking it's nice to have him at a place but but it's still it still has to be so different um and it, it can't be repeating the same patterns and um yeah no it's it's such a huge theme and i don't think i'll get to any like bright conclusions tonight i just think that it's important to consider the option uh, and not only like i've been thinking like taking everything on the outside of the system yes we're doing everything on a parallel uh route definitely but how could we all come together and kind of shake up the system and have it maybe even crumble so that we could build up something new? And I can see that in Sweden, for instance. Sweden has been, for a hundred years at least, it's been building systems and it's been building systems with good intentions. Uh, unfortunately, now the systems aren't working and uh, they seem to be impossible to move. But I still have faith. I do believe that we can move them, but they have to be shaken up from the outside. Nice. Yeah, um, I agree. That's such a good question. So I'm sitting here, do we need schools? I feel like I don't think that we necessarily have to need schools, um, but we need something, <laughs> you know. And so in my mind's eye, you know, it looks like community. It looks like multi-ages. It looks like elders and young people. It looks like mentors. It looks like apprenticeships. It looks like supporting people. Um, it looks like supporting people of all ages. And, and definitely it looks like, um, you know, um, honoring, honoring a person's past, you know, and, and even just honoring that maybe someone, you know, just wants to sit and just be, 
you know, <laughs> just honoring how we show up vibrationally, energetically, um, and just recognizing that um, we all have something to give, that we all um, have beauty, that we all have purpose, and that we all matter, you know. So whatever you would call that, that's what I think you need. <laughs> yeah, so I'd like to add a perspective here as well. So what I see is really important is to look at the question of what is school, right? Because we have to always take the fact that we've been indoctrinated into account. So when we look at the word school, we think that we look at it objectively. And now I'm talking like all of us in society as a general point. We think we're looking at something that exists objectively. But the way that we've learned to look at school is programmed, is we've been programmed to see it and define it a specific way. Um, to show that you can speak to someone who's never been to school, whose process of education in an indigenous community has a completely different structure. So to them, me saying, but school is education would be completely foreign. No, they would say, no, education is going out with my father and learning how to fish, right? That is my process of learning. So we have to remember that, that this concept is is a product of the very same system. It's a, it is a product of a system. It is symptomatic of a system. Um, and in that, what I found very empowering and very impo important is to investigate the real history of the education system. And for this, I definitely suggest listening to John Taylor Gatto's um, history of the education system, where he and he's not the only one, but he's one of the people who discloses the fact that the education system as we know it was created deliberately to keep the masses, uh, you know, keep them uh, at bay or keep them contained. So if we look at also what you guys were talking about earlier with unschooling um, in terms of having, you know, doing what you want. So if we imagine a, an unschooled learning space or unschooled learning process, what is it that happens there is that the individual's purpose, the individual's unique qualities comes out. And right now we have a system where everything is streamlined. Everything is, um, you have to conform to one system. It's supposed to be a one size fits all. And everyone knows that that's not true. So in a learning space or in an education system that focuses on honoring your individual purpose, Imagine the diversity that would emerge from that. Ima like we can't, like you were saying, Becca, we can't even imagine it because we've never done it before. We have no idea what that would look like. And that's not a bad thing. We don't have to know what that would look like. Um, so what we're doing right now with this panel and in our, each of our communities is that we're laying the foundation. We have to, as adults, first change ourselves so that we stand as an example of at least a potential of how it could be different. And then it is up to the generations to come to take it from there and actually manifest it into, you know, a substantial difference in, in the world. Um, and I find that to be really important and really cool to take that, you know, as an adult, to take that humbleness and that step back of saying, I take it upon myself to participate in laying the foundation, um, but then I'm going to step back because it is up to you guys, you know, to to take it to take it forward into what it is going to be. And I would also say that it is not possible to do that within the system as we have it today, because the school and the system is is completely intricate intricately interconnected it's two parts of the same thing so you cannot suddenly have you know everyone unschooling in a capitalist in a consumer capitalist system it's not going to work because it is based on needing conformist uh, workers that accept themselves as slaves but the way to change that from my perspective is we do that one by one i do that by having honest authentic conversations with my neighbors and then something starts waking up in him and someone else tells, you know, that is, I, 
it, it can seem, if you try and look at the big sch scheme of things, it can seem like almost impossible, but that is the way to do it. That's what I found is by one, one by one, we start all of us like awaking and rising um, to what is real, to what is authentic, removing these, these illusions um, that we have uh, covered ourselves in, in this world. Mm. Anna, Anna, Anna. Honey, honey, honey. That was so good. <laughs> that was so, that was just wonderful. I, I really love that you said things like authentic conversation. You know, just like learning, there, we, there isn't one formalized, proper and right way to approach the thing. We're talking about human beings, you know, we're, we're talking about people. So I, I believe that we do need schools because especially because different parts of the world, being at home means different things. You know, facilitating a learning space is not, in other words, everybody's child isn't going through what my children go through at home. So I do think that it is important, in, especially in certain parts of the world, to have a space where a person, child or adult, can go and have that focused time, because it's like a sanctuary, right? For exploration in a sense. And that's what I think school should be. And I think, um, and I love how Oshulade brought up the aspect of intergenerational connections. That's a huge thing for me. That's one of the things that I didn't know I didn't know. Two years out of homeschooling or, or regular school and into unschooling, I was like, ah, oh my God. So my children were sitting there with other children their age, and that's it. That's the, you know, they may have other commonalities, but they're grouped by age. Where else in the world is that going to happen? Like, where else in the world are you just going to be sitting with a group of people and supposedly building and creating based on age? It's not based on age. You need knowledge from your elders. You need connection and reminders from the young ones. You need other people who look differently and sound differently. We need all of those things. And so it's so important to have a space where that sort of thing is happening. And I love that, Becca and Anna, that you're working. Becca, you created something different, which I think is just brilliant and brave and badass. And then, Anna, the way that you decided to work through the system and say, oh, wait, this is what I'm like, this, this is what we need more of. And for me, I do that through my writing because more than anything else, like my primary thing is I'm a writer. I am a storyteller. And then I just find places to just kind of talk about whatever I wrote. That's like the whole business model, right? So for me, I, I'm always talking about radical self-expression and, and, and the perspective of children and how they remind us. Like we always think we need to have the plan and the structure first and make a move. But when you look at children, when my daughters get up and they take on their day we do set goals. We talk about our goals on Sunday and we check in and they do current events. You know, there's some aspects of it that they probably don't want to do, but we require because context, you know, and that's what we say. It isn't, it, it doesn't feel like we're trying to figure them out and make them do anything. We're, we're helping them to stay connected to the context of the system that they're in so that they're not just in this little myopic area thinking that everybody is living like they live. Right. So that's why we do those things. But when you when you do it out loud, like the writing and working inside the system and being the support that you, you are like Ocean Lade's whole model of creating these support systems for people in this way to connect, not just with learning, but with themselves, with their authentic selves. That's what's going to change it. And that's how the new definition of, of learning together is going to take form. That's how school is going to there's going to be this metamorphosis emphasis where people are going to reject it and it's not even going to feel radical. That's, that's what I think. I think it's not going to feel, or I hope it's not going to feel radical. It's just going to feel like the next natural step, just like for us where we do it. And it's like, yeah, of course I'm doing this. I can't not do this. I'm trying to figure out how I can do more of this. I think that's going to continue to happen through the ways, like Anna said, just creating that authentic dialogue in those spaces that we live in our real life. Yeah amazing i am high off of the passion from this panel this has been such an amazing show um and i i'm having a hard time believing that we're almost at the end of two hours which i mean it flew by we're, we're chatting in the box saying that it felt like 
oh my gosh, this has only been five minutes. But before we run out of time, I'd love for everybody in the panel to share with, with, with the world what your vision is for alternative education. So panel, take it away. I'll hop in. Um, I think my vision for alternative education is my vision for the world. And, you know, it's just simple. I, I would love a world <laughs> that works for everyone. You know, no matter, um, you know, no matter what your skills are, no matter what your gifts are, no matter what your ethnicity is, your spiritual inclination, you know, a world that works for everyone. Everyone is, um, like I said before, seen as valuable, uh, respected, honored, um, recognized thing. So that's my vision. Beautiful, beautiful. I what she said. No, just basically <laughs> basically everything Ocean Lade just said. A space that that um and I and what I would add to that is the prioritization of creating spaces that work for people. That's all. Because I I, I believe that we can do that. There are options for us to just have these in, in my brain, like I'm a major hip hop head. So like I think of it as just like these ciphers, you know, where everybody who's into again, like anime and manga, like my girls would just be in a cipher for like weeks or months or hours or minutes or whatever works for them. And then you go on over into another space. Like that's what I think learning looks like, I don't even like the term education because I attach that formality to it that Anna talked about. And, and I know that's my own baggage, but learning space, I, I would like for it to be more of a focus on learning and connectivity and the, the prioritization of that. So like what Becca did because she needed to see it. So she just put her hand in the creation of it that, that we did that. And like Lainey, what you did where you said, okay, well, I want this for myself and my son, so I'm going to create it. And you didn't have, I'm sure, the grand plan of the 15 point process for doing whatever the hell, right? You did, you connect with the thing so much that it moves you. And I, and I, and I just feel like we need more of that. And, and I'd like to add, which might seem a little bit out of context, but it isn't, mothering, not motherhood, but mothering, like the, this idea that you are responsible for the people you come into contact with, you are responsible in a sense for doing something to make something better for them in a way. And it doesn't have to be a grand thing. It can be something simple like smiling or asking them how they're doing or whatever. But that, that is that vision that we take on this idea of mothering. So learning what we need and, and nurturing that because that's what mothering is and facilitating that and prioritizing that. That's, that's what I really, really want for, the, for learning as a movement. Wow, it, this is this is so inspirational. I I didn't have any expectations when we went online, but I, I'm just so full of joy, honestly, to be able to share all these um, all these ideas and all these thoughts. And I think that you know I I'll go into everything that Angelade and Akila are saying because I think that that is it really. I I just wish that every single soul that comes down here on this planet can, can feel honored as beings and feel that their talents and their intelligences can meet up and hook up with their passions so that they can be really truly be who they came to be and, and find a system that could be flexible. I don't know if if in the definition of a system, <laughs> there is something as flexibility, but I wish for flexibility to exist because we're all different. And, and I think it would be beautiful to be able to create these learning spaces where we could just all come together and grow regardless of age, because we, I mean, God, now I, you know, let not, not the age thing, but the thing is we all keep on learning. And if we want to, and we can all keep on growing if we want to. And I think that it would be incredible if we could just have that kind of movement going. So it's not that you're ever finished because who said that you would finish at 18? I, I, 
you know, I'm not finished. I'm 44. <laughs> I'm still learning and growing. And so just like have to have these spaces where we can come together and also share, share what we know uh, in, in, a, in a respectful way, you know, and, uh, and just to be able to inspire each other. I think that that would be absolutely fantastic. All right, so I'll add my two cents here as well. So I agree with what all of you ladies have said. So I'll maybe take it from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, because like I said earlier, we don't know what a system will look like that will come from being born from human beings that, had, that has grown up without being restricted, without being limited, without being repressed. So I'm not even, you know, because, and, and I mean, I, I do find that it can be fun and supportive to imagine that, but I also say that it's, it's not really that even necessary. So what I do see in terms of my vision for the alternative education movement would be in terms of right now or like in the near future to eventually get to that point of being able to establish a completely different way of viewing and approaching education in the world. So that would be for each person that has this passion and this drive and that has the authenticity and the humbleness to not take yourself for granted in terms of just automatically believing that, you know, to not create new doctrines is what I mean, to always question yourself, to always be humble. Um, those people, which I would say that we include, um, to trust the vision that you see, to trust whatever it is that you see that you can do in your community or online or in your family, um, whether, you know, it may seem very small and it may seem like it's not going to make a huge difference. And I'm especially here talking to the women of this world as well, because I really do see that it, it, a lot of this is going to be, a lot of this movement has to come from the women because we to a certain extent we've never really been able to but we have also never really ourselves stepped up to the power that is within us and the strength that is within us and this is not to say anything bad about males um, but i'm talking about in terms of the cultural programming and all of that and how education and parenting traditionally does come from like i was saying to the panel you know women are the guardians of traditions we're the ones who tell the children what they can't you know we're the ones that that sort of guard them and so we can open that entire space up. So I would really envision that we, each of us that stands as a pillar in our community, that we come together and that we do not feel um, disempowered by the magnitude of the system and the bureaucracy and the politics and all of that. You don't even have to, you know, if you're able to, and you if you have that kind of, power go for it but you don't have to think that that's the only way to change things and you know you can actually make a difference in the space that you are in so it's about seeing you know first you have that point of seeing i see that it can be different i see that it shouldn't be this way and then from there you start looking at okay so what do I, what skills do i have what resources do I have? What opportunities do I have in my community? Even though right now it may not be a lot, you start from there. And that is how this change is going to happen on a very real and fundamental level because you will see it directly. And from there, it can begin rippling into the larger communities. And, and that is where you know the substantial change is gonna come from on a systemic level. So that will be my input. <laughs> I am still so incredibly inspired by each and every women, each and every one of you on this panel. This has been such an incredible show. I hate to have to close it off, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to Anne, I'm going to ask you to um, share your websites and any closing remarks. So um, we have time and space for that now. So who would like to start? I'll start. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so in closing, one, gratitude, major, major gratitude. I feel like now I just want to go get my mint tea and just be quiet. 
Um, <laughs> the, so just in, in closing, I think for anyone who is watching this because you are interested in either community, because I know for a lot of us who are part of this alternative learning movement, finding community can be challenging. Um, now you know one, two, three, four, five people that you can reach out to online at the very least to start to look at creating community. So don't hesitate to do that. I think we're friendly. I think you're good where that's concerned. Um, and also for anyone who is watching and who is um, interested in it, but have, has a lot of questions or concerns or doubts, that's completely normal, healthy even. So look at the resources that Lainey has put together right here in front of you as a starting point. And then also, as Anna said, trust your vision. If you have this crazy idea that something needs to be different, trust it whatever that means for you start there um and and that's it and and for me i'm over at radicalselfie.com or my name akila s richards.com and um i'm a bit of i'm all over the internet so if you just google my name but i'm always open to uh, dialogue around this movement so if anybody is curious about that feel free And Rebecca, why don't you jump in next? Yeah, I have to say that I'm, um, I'm feeling so much joy and inspiration because the community thing, as you, as you mentioned, Akiva, sometimes is, is really hard. I mean, we do have like family communities, obviously, you know, the families of the, the, the parents of the, the kids and the kids and all that. But that doesn't mean that they're carrying the same kind of interest or passion. They want something different, but it's not the same thing as when you get together with people who really talk about this, who live it, and who, who can't really think about anything else <laughs> but this. And so to me, it, it, feels, it feels extremely valuable to, to be able to be part of this tonight. And, uh, and I think that I'm leaving with a lot more clarity, uh, and a lot more clarity, honestly. And... Uh, and that feels good. I think that it's, uh, we have to understand that we are being pioneers and being pioneers means that we will probably be rejected by, by many people, uh, but someone needs to start it. And if that means it's us, well, you know, we're already doing it. So if there are more people who are interested in joining, you know, you should know that you're not alone. We've already started plowing the way, you know, through, I can see this snowy, road in Sweden and we're you know plowing plowing away all the snow to just like create a road that we can walk on and the road doesn't have to look the same for everyone. I don't think that there is anything wrong or anything right particularly. I think that there is only what works and what doesn't work. And to me that is the most important factor in all this. It's like what works and what doesn't work and and that is what is guiding me. Uh, through all this because right now we're having these two schools and they're two precious little schools but it doesn't stop me from thinking hmm should uh should junior high and high school really have the same format or should we open up to something different and i'm being more and more convinced every day that we we should question what we're doing and even though we found a really good form for kindergarten and and the primary school i do think that that there are more ways to do this and also opening up for a bigger community, people that might not have been interested before, but when once their children reach uh, adolescence, they realize that the school is not doing it for them and they'll come to us because we will have a different option for them. And that that would feel absolutely fantastic. But I do, I do have a strong personal need of connecting with people all over the world in order to see what can be done together because, because it can feel pretty lonely. <laughs> Uh, and I think that it's really important to basically just, you know, join hands and, and uh, dig in together because it's a huge theme and it's a theme that can really transform the world. I'll hop in. Um, so I guess what's showing up, what's showing up for me to share right now is um, so you know, I'm on this panel, obviously, and I have been supporting an alternative learning lifestyle for my children. Um, so that is what I guess I'm reaching 
from as I'm discussing what I'm discussing tonight or sharing what I'm sharing, just some beliefs and thoughts that I have and some experiences that I've experienced um, as a mama. But one of the things that I would just like to say in closing, what I really focus on, you know, and I, you know, I probably speak two or three times a year at different alternative education conferences, um, um, retreats, workshops, but I'm always focusing on us, the parents, you know, usually the mom, or, but it's usually the parent in general, because I feel like that's where the work is. You know, we can talk about how we want to support kids all we want and how we want to create things all we want. But unless we're doing that inner work, unless we're tapping into our own stuff and shifting our own consciousness and releasing it and learning to listen to that intuition and learning to listen to that inspiration, you know, everything that we think sounds good, you know, it's going to be just like all for naught. And so um, that's, that's really what comes, comes to me. And so that's, that's how, um, how I show up in the world and that's what I focus on. I rarely even talk about um, the learning part, you know, I, I mean, I talk about it, but you know what I'm saying. But like when I'm sharing with people and helping with people, how, how do we expand our consciousness? How do we, um, you know, you'll hear people say de-schooling, you know, all of those things have something to do with us showing up fully. And I, as I think about it, I remember Akiva, you were saying, how do we inspire learning? And, and I, I know I'm messing up the quote, but you were like, we live it, you know? And so let's, let's focus on all the things that we want for our children. Let's be that for ourselves. And that is what's going to shift, in my opinion. That's what's going to shift us, shift our children, and shift the world. And you can find me at um, Oh Shoot My Day Heels. Um, I think my name, I think everyone can see my name, Oh Shoot My Day, O S U N L A D E, Heels, H E A L S dot com. And you can contact me there. I'm also on Facebook. I think there's only one other Oh Shoot My Day that you'll see so far on Facebook. Um, so that's the musician. I'm the other one. So you can find me and uh, we can talk about all that inner work and tapping into our inspiration and letting go of our traumas and the other stuff um, that may be burdened. Thank you Lane, so much and all of you. Yeah, and I'd also like to say thank you so much, Lainey. Thank you so much for doing this and, and bringing us together here and for everything that you do in, in your work. Um, and I really agree with what you say, Angelade. I really agree that, you know, we have to start with ourselves. That is the most fundamental point. And, and that's vulnerable and it's, it can be painful. And it is very easy to create this, you know, false sense of self of thinking that I got it all together and I because that's kind of what we think we have to be as adults right we have to tell our children that you know I know everything and I have everything under control but I mean just look at this world we have no idea what we're doing really so like that like you know so we also have to start over we also have to learn from scratch what does it mean to live on this planet in a way that is sustainable, in a way like you were saying, Becca, in a way that works for everyone, including the animals, including the earth itself. And, and that is not spiritual mumbo jumbo. It's not, you know, and if ever, anyone tells you that, you know, don't listen to it because it's commonsensical, obviously, you know. So I, I really agree with you that, that we start with ourselves and then from there, you know, we start, you know, once we have a solid foundation or clear foundation in ourselves, which is something that we continuously work on. It's not like, okay, now I'm finished. Now I can go save the world. <laughs> you know, that's not how it happens. And, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. We can learn from each other, but I absolutely agree with you. And I'm also available online. Um, I'm I also on a personal level. Um, I do life coaching as well. So in terms of that, you could say the personal, the psychological aspect of it. I'm also very interested in that. So I'm glad that you brought that up, Anshulade. So thank you so much, Lainey, for having us.
And I just want to thank this this panel. This panel has been incredible. I am so incredibly inspired. <laughs> I mean, this is oh, this has been such a joy. Thank you, thank you, Mel. Thank you, Biggie, and thank you to everybody over at the uh, Conscious Consumer Network. We are grateful to have a platform to be able to. Um, share this inspiration and, and have these really important conversations. And finally, I'd like to thank Nina, my fabulous producer. With, without you, I could not put together a panel like this and, and remain inspired. And so your work is so appreciated. Thank you, Nina. So in closing, I'd just like to say wherever you are and whatever you do, always continue doing it for the love of learning. And that's a wrap.